Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. Hey everyone, welcome to today's show. I'm your host, Milton Brown, and we are joined by a great author today. We will be joined by Tensi J. Taylor, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Tensi J. Taylor is from Lewisburg, North Carolina. She graduated from North Carolina State University, and I got to give a shout out because she was with me, NC State, throw up the wolf pack, <laughs> with a Bachelor of Arts in Communication Media Concentration and a minor in psychology, and from the University of South California in 2014 with a Master of Education in Post-Secondary Administration and Student Affairs. Currently, Tensi is the Assistant Director of the USC Black Alumni Association, and in this role, she plans, coordinates, and executes programs and events for the Black Alumni Association, directs the legacy through leadership, mentorship, and assists with Toastmasters International. Tensi also serves on the board of directors for the We Are Onaha Foundation, an organization that is dedicated to finding resources and helping foster youth in Los Angeles. In addition to working at USC, Tensi is a red carpet host for the online network RichGirlsNetwork.tv. As a host, she has interviewed numerous celebrities at galas, charity functions, community service events, award shows, and film festivals. Tensi has attended the Oscars, People Choice Award, BET Celebration of Gospel, NAACP Image Awards, Grammys, and BET Awards. Tensi has recited and traveled across the United States making presentations and speech- speeches since the age of three. Today, she will join us and speak about her book, Bullied, From Terror to Triumph. I would love to introduce all of you wonderful listeners to my good friend, Tensi Taylor. How are you doing today? I am doing well, Milton. How are you? And again, thank you for having me on your show. Oh, it is a pleasure. Thank you for agreeing with all that. I was losing breath reading some of your accomplishments, and that doesn't even scratch the surface. (laughs) Oh, you're so kind. Yes, hard work and networking and making my dreams come true have made it possible for me to do so much in North Carolina and Los Angeles. Yes, and I'm glad you said making your dreams come true because I read your book and I was drawn in from beginning to end and I never knew some of the things that you went through. It's amazing because with my experience with you, we both went to NC State. Every time I saw you, you you were happy, you were smiling. We spoke here and there, Um, but it was always a positive experience. And then when I went through this book and seen some of the situations and struggles that you went through, I was in complete awe. Yeah, a lot of people have shared that with me. And in one of the chapters in my book, I'm sure you remember, it was the chapter I talked about, we wear the mask. And I wore the mask that I would put up a front, a facade, that everything was okay. But for 13 years, from kindergarten through 12th grade, I was physically, verbally, and emotionally bullied. It all started on my very first day of kindergarten in August of 1992. And from there, students just had a field day with me and bullied me and were very cruel to me. I'm a small person, as you know, Milton, but for your listeners, I'm very small and petite, and I'm short. I loved learning. I was a straight-A student, and students picked on me because I was small, because I loved learning. They called me names such as Geek nerd. Um, They made fun of my appearance. They called me names such as Big Eyed Freak, Geico Direct. They threw food at me in the cafeteria and on the bus. In one instance, a student tried to break my arm because I refused to open the locker room door for her after she demanded that I do so. I was dangled from a two-story building, everything. So I went through a lot in my life, but I had a strong support system with my parents, and they gave me encouragement and wiped away my tears and told me to keep going. What was your parents' response when they had that opportunity to read your book for the first time? They were shocked because I didn't share everything with them about what I went through in 
school. So the incident where the student tried to break my arm, I did tell my mom about that because I was afraid, terribly afraid of what she would do next, and my mom handled that situation. But a lot of the times I didn't share with them what was transpiring at school because it made matters worse. Students would say, oh, you have your mommy fighting your battles. You can't stand up for yourself. I mean, they were just even more mean to me once my parents got involved. And so when my mom and dad read the book, they were shocked. They cried. And then my mom said, my mom said, my poor baby, I didn't know you went through all that. Why didn't you tell me? But I said, Mom, I was just afraid to tell you because I thought students would make my life even more miserable. Wow. That, that, that's, I, I can't put in the words about that particular thing, about being afraid to come to your parents or knowing that if you go to your parents or another person in authority that it can make the situation so much worse because they can't be with you 24 hours a day. They're right. with you a majority of the time, but there are some times where they, you are not in their view. And sometimes mm -hmm. that's all it takes. Right. Right. I, I'm that's reminded very true. of that little girl that tragically lost her life because of bullying situation in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that could be and that's what Go ahead. Yes, you're right. That could be anyone and that's what makes me so mad. I get so uh, riled up about this is that adults will know, teachers will know, principals, administrators, they sometimes they know what is going on at school. Students have come to them about the bullying and the teachers will just say, "Well, that's not my job or you should toughen up." Or, you know, be a big person about it. Don't, don't come running to me. And that only makes matters worse because bullying is such a tragic situation. And just as you mentioned, Milton, about that young girl who lost her life, here you had so many people who were filming this event and egging these students on. They should have been running to get an adult to say, come quickly. This girl is being beaten. But no, people want to film it on their cell phones and laugh and think it's a joke. It's not funny. So we as a society, adults, teachers, administrators, friends, take this seriously because we are losing lives from others and a lot of the victims of bullying are taking their own lives because they feel that they have no support system. Exactly. Exactly. So in your book, you, you've got, you went very, very deep into your experience and there are a lot of personal incidences um, that happened. What made you decide to put all of your personal experiences in a book for the public to read? I decided that I needed to be vulnerable because, as I mentioned, I just continue to hear so many stories of young people being bullied and taking their lives. I mean, since the month of February, I have read at least eight stories of people who have even either been killed by a bully or have taken their own lives. And so I just was saddened by hearing these stories, and I wanted to share my story. And as you know, and if the readers, when they purchase my book, they will know, too, that I go very deep into my physical appearance about how guys and girls made fun of me because of the way I look, to being sexually assaulted at a young age. I just wanted to put it all out there to let people know what I had been through, but I did not let that discouraged me. I did not, you know, I wasn't uh, mellowing in my misery and feeling sorry for myself. Yes, it's unfortunate that those situations happen, but I picked myself up and I was determined to be a better Tensi and to share my story in hopes of helping others. And people have reached out to me. All of my social media information is listed in the back of the book. People have sent messages to me thanking me for telling my story. One girl, 11 years old, wrote to me and said she hated reading, but a teacher had heard about my book and gave it to her. She read my book in one night. The book is two, more than 200 pages, and mm -hmm. she was being bullied. So she said, I now know what to do if I'm being bullied. I know how to have persistence and perseverance and determination. And it was also a very cathartic process, getting it all out. You know, I'm not ashamed of what I wrote. That's my story. That's what happened. 
and my hope was to help others to bring about healing and to start more conversations. Yes. And you mentioned earlier about being sexually assaulted, and I read that in your book, and I let our listeners go purchase the book. You, you can easily get it on Amazon, and there are other outlets to have it. But So I won't go too deep in what was in the book, but when I read that part when you got sexually assaulted, I literally dropped my book. I, I, I couldn't read for a while. I had to stop and process. I had no idea in it. It put everything in perspective, how easily something like that could happen. And your brother was literally right beside you as yes. this was happening. Yes. And, and yeah, it, it was, it was very shocking. And I was 14 and, um, you know, readers buy the book to learn what happened, but right there. So I'm like, big brother is beside me. I feel safe. And this person thought that he had the right to do what he did. And ever since then, I've always been a cautious person. But ever since that incident, I have been even more cautious. And my mom always taught me at a young age, never trust anybody but Jesus Christ. Those were her words. I mean, you can't trust a friend. You can't trust a stranger. You really can't trust anyone because some people you think have your best interest at heart. They don't. They just want to harm you. And so ever since 14, I have been very cautious, even more of my surroundings and who's beside me. And even when I rode that ride several years later, more than 10 years later, it it brought back memories of that little girl, 14 years old, and what happened. So parents, like you said earlier, Milton, parents can't be everywhere. But, you know, teach your children to, to be safe, to learn how to tell an adult, Maybe enroll them in, uh, in, in Taekwondo lessons or martial arts to learn how to defend themselves. Because in this world, people have gone mad. People are crazy. Every time I read a story today, someone's either died or has, has done a mass amount of killings. I mean, you know, you're not safe anywhere. So at least if, if a young person has some type of defense skills to, to help them, it might, it might be very beneficial. Exactly. So... One of the challenges that a lot of children and some adults see with bullying are some aspects that people don't really see it, see the act or action as bullying. Could you share some common mis- misconceptions about bullying and signs that other people can look out for so we can address the problem appropriately? Yes. Yeah, so. People who read my book and knew me in school were shocked to learn about everything that transpired. But a lot of the bullying, it didn't take place overtly. It took place covertly. So in the locker room, after school, on the recess field, on the playground. I mean, teachers, like I said, and administrators can't be everywhere. But I really want to encourage people that if someone is telling you that he or she is being bullied, Please take that seriously. Don't say, oh, I didn't see that happening, so it must not have happened, or you need to toughen up. Those words don't help at all. And um, some of the misconceptions, too, is a lot of people have been shocked. Oh, my gosh, you? You were bullied? Why were they bullying you? I mean, you're so nice and kind. And, And then they would say, well, you don't look like you've been bullied. That's a pet peeve of mine. So I'm supposed to walk around looking depressed and sad and mad at the world because of what I went through? No. So just because, like you said, Milton, earlier, I was very nice and pleasant, that doesn't mean I'm not going through something. I just don't show my emotion on my face or wear it on my sleeve. But if someone is confiding in you, please take that seriously. And I really want to encourage adults to be mindful, you know, to be bullying takes place in the restroom, at schools. I mean, teachers, you can't be everywhere, but you should kind of know where some of the bullying takes place, in the bathroom, in locker rooms, after school, on the playground, um, some places that people might not think. So that's a lot of type of misconceptions that because I'm not walking around looking sad and depressed, that this must not have happened to me. I give the example of Robin Williams. He was one of the greatest actors of all the time, and he was a funny guy, and the world was shocked when they found out he had taken his life. And they said, how could Robin Williams, such a funny guy, and he loved acting, why would he take his life? Well, something was going on. He was depressed, but nobody saw that. 
So just mm-hmm. because someone looks okay on the outside does not mean that they are not going through stuff on the inside, which is why I encourage people to be kind, to be nice. If someone, if you don't like someone, that's fine. Don't go out of your way to deliberately make their life miserable. The students, if they didn't like me, that's fine. They're entitled to feel how they feel, but they intentionally went out of their way to make my life miserable. So adults, teachers, please look out for the signs. And also those students who are bullied, there are signs with them. They might start to be more reserved or they might start counting down the days. I would count down the days like, oh, my gosh, you know, 80 more days until the school year ends. And my mom said, why are you counting down the days? I thought you liked school. Um, So just pay attention. Be cognizant of of students, of your own child, to see what's going on. Because if you're aware and can recognize these signs and symptoms, you might save a life. And one thing that I really think is important for is parents. Parents Mm -hmm. to really understand and how to approach their child. Because like you said, um, your parents were shocked to see mm-hmm. some of the things that you went through because you you didn't go and tell them every single thing that happened. What are some advice, what are some things that you can give for our parents to get their children to open up about some of the things so they can address the problem and help them? Parents, have daily conversations with your kids When I grew up, we had dinner. It was family dinner every night. There was no TV. There were no distractions. We talked. And mom and dad said, how was your day at school? What did you learn? And, you know, I would tell them, you know, some things about what was going on at school, but I didn't tell them everything. And like I said, I was good at putting on a front that everything was okay. And it's not that if I had told my parents, it would have made matters worse in the home. It's just I was afraid of what the students would do at school because they would have more of a field day. But parents, what I really want is for you to recognize that your child might not be an angel. I know that um, when my mom confronted the bully who tried to break my arm, my mother talked to the bully's mother, and the bully's mother was like, well, my child doesn't act like that at home. Tensy must have done something to her. The mother was in denial. And here, this girl tried to break my arm, no apology, Nothing. She said that her daughter possibly could not have done that. So parents recognize that your child might make mistakes. They're not, they are not perfect. But please, if someone is coming to you and telling you what your child has done wrong, listen. Don't get defensive. Don't get upset. Don't curse the person out. But listen, because some students can act one way at home and then act a totally different way at school. Parents also teach discipline. Um, it's, I, just, I work with a lot of young people, and I'm just amazed at attitudes that they have. If I try to speak to them and help them, they will either yell at me or say some mean words towards me. I can't even correct a student or a child today because the student will either say something harsh to me or just say something rude. Parents, please raise your children to be respectful, to be mannerable, to learn how to be polite to others. Teach them those type of morals and values, and I promise you they will continue to go further in life. So many young people miss out on opportunities because of their mouth, because of their attitude, because they don't listen. They fall in with the wrong crowd. But parents, teach your children morals, how to treat everyone respectfully, whether they are the custodial worker or they are President Obama. They are still a human being and need to be treated as such. So we need to go back to the days of the old school of parenting in, in which you, you instill morals and values and discipline children. That is a lost art, and we need to get back to that. Exactly. You are completely true. I mean, you are completely right about that. Um, what's the biggest message you would like your readers to take from your book? My biggest message is it is about my story on bullying. So if you've been bullied or you were a bully, then you can relate. But also anybody, anybody can relate to my book because it's about overcoming an obstacle or adversity. I am sure that everyone in society has had to overcome an obstacle, whether it's someone telling you you won't be anybody in life or someone laughing at your dream or having to deal with the death of a loved one. That's an obstacle. That's a challenge that you have to overcome. But as I mentioned earlier, you can't sit and wallow. You can't 
feel bad for yourself because that is going to get you nowhere. You have to recognize where you are, get the help and resources that you need, and pull yourself back up and make everything come true. If I had listened to the advice or the words that students gave me that said, you won't be anybody in life, or you're ugly, you're a big-eyed freak, I would still be a self-conscious person living in North Carolina, probably not being a productive citizen. But because I use that negativity as more energy to fuel my dreams. And I said, okay, you don't like me now because I won five awards? Well, you're really not going to like me next time because I'm going to win 10. Mm -hmm. I was trying to prove them wrong, but also make my dreams come true. You can't always be the victim your whole life. You can't. When you play the victim card your whole life, you're not going to go as far. You're not going to be as successful. And because I turn the negativity into positivity. I am 28 years old. I've been to 18 countries, five continents. I work with students. I've been an actress in a movie, an actress in a television show. I was on Wheel of Fortune. I've been on more than 175 red carpets in Hollywood, have met and interviewed more than 300 celebrities, including Oprah. So, again, these students who bullied me are now like, oh, my gosh, I went to school with her. I know her. That's my friend. No, you, you, you're you not my friend, but be careful how you treat people because, first of all, you should treat people right because that's the proper thing to do. And secondly, you never know who they will become. I have talked to so many celebrities on the red carpet who said they were bullied, who said students made fun of them in school, and now they're like, oh, my gosh, I know her. You know, Beyonce, she was bullied in school. Students picked on her in school, and now look who she has become. So be Mm -hmm. kind, be nice, but don't be the victim. Everybody has gone through something. Try to find your way out of it so you can come out triumphant. Well, thank you so much, Tensi. Um, I don't want you to feel like I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'm about to put you on the spot. In your book, you mentioned ever since you were a little girl, you could recite something. (laughs) I'm sure you know yes. where I'm going. Which, yes, is it at I do. All possible for you to sh- let our listeners hear how um, you can recite by memory the "I Have a Dream" speech. Yes, you want me to do the whole one or just a brief part? I'll I'll, I'll leave it up to you because. I want to hear that excitement. And I, I read the book, and I just imagine you saying it, the excitement, the emotion you placed in there. And I got that from the book, so I couldn't let this opportunity slip through my fingers. I have to hear you do this. <laughs> okay, I am ready. I will do. Uh, all right, here we go. I learned this when I was three years old, and I traveled all across the country reciting it. One of Dr. King's most famous speeches, I Have a Dream. So here we go. I shall recite, I Have a Dream, by Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I say to you today, my friends, so even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with this governor having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification, One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that every valley should be exalted. The crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed 
and all flesh shall see it. This is the day, this is the hope that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will hew out the mountain of despair, a stone, a hope. With this faith, we shall work together, pray together, struggle together, go to jail together, stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day when all of God's children will sing with new meaning, my country tis of thee, sweet land of liberty of thee I sing, land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, from every mountainside. And if America is to be a great nation, this must become true. So let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of New Hampshire. Let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and every mole hill in Mississippi, from every mountainside. And when we allow freedom to ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and from every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the Negro spiritual. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Amazing. Wow. And I can only imagine three. You were three. three. Oh, there, man. Three. All of that. Yes, yeah, they had. To, I was so tiny and short. They had to put a chair for me to stand on in the pulpit, and then put phone books in the chair so that people <laughs> could see me over the over the microphone. Um, um. <laughs> I'm done. If I saw you do that in person, I'll have to tap out. Look, you little three-year-old Tensy, it's doing all that. It's, wow. Thank you. Thank you, Tensy. Thank you, Milton. For... And can I say um, one last thing? Well, two last things. One, um, people, the name, can, people can purchase my book. It's available on Amazon, online, online through uh, Barnes & Noble and Books A Million. The name of it is Bullied from Terror to Triumph my survival story, and please follow me on social media. I follow back, and my Instagram is Tensie Taylor, T-E-N-S-I-E Taylor. My Twitter is Miss Tensie, M-S-T-E-N-S-I-E, and then my fan page is Tensie J. Taylor. So follow me. Let's interact. Let's keep the conversation going um, because this is such a very powerful topic to me. And, again, thank you so much, Milton, for having me on your show. You got me pumped. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for agreeing to be on the show. It is, has been awesome, and we, we have to do something else together because, wow, you get, gave great information. You had me pumped, had me going, and then you end with such a great speech from memory it's been too long. We can't go another 27 years without talking. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> we have to do better. <laughs> yes, yes. But stay on the line. I'm going to um, get a little bit more information for you before we go. But thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and all our listeners across the globe for tuning in. And remember, you can get her book at Amazon and at other digital outlets, um, including Barnes & Noble's, and it's called Bullied. From Terror to Triumph, My Survival Story by Tensi J. Taylor. Go out there and once again continue to have a fantastically wonderful day. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.